All right, chapter 14, sound. Um, this is going to be a long one, so I won't waste your time by talking too much. Here we go. The Doppler effect. Um, so this is something you actually experience all the time. Every time you are standing on the corner waiting for um, the light to change and the traffic comes by you, you get this... Mm, right? So there's a, high p uh, there's a higher frequency... <clears throat> when the object that is generating the sound is coming towards you, and a lower one when it's moving away. I suppose as a kid, I thought <clears throat> that the um, they were dropping down a gear or something exactly when they moved by me all the time, but that's obviously just uh, silly and not true. Um, neither sound is correct. The one coming towards you is higher frequency. The one going low is a lower frequency, and how much that frequency change depends on the sound. And what, what I'd like you to get a sense is a visual sense of what's happening with the sound waves. And then there's a bunch of different formulas to work with <coughs> for this uh, Doppler effect stuff. So pause often, keep your notebook handy. It's going to be a long one. All right. So it's coming towards you, you have a higher frequency. When it's going away from you, you have a, you hear a lower frequency than it would be if it were just sitting still. That's important. <clears throat> um, you notice it with sound waves more often because you're pretty sensitive to sound waves. The difference in light waves when an object moving towards you and away is super subtle because the, the waves are moving so fast that the, the speed of light compared to the speed of the object is unnoticeably different. And we just don't see variations in color that distinctly. However, it does happen with light. When an object is moving towards you, you get blue shift. And when it shifts towards the blue end of the light spectrum, when it's moving away, you get something called the red shift. And the light is shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. Whether it be in the visible or not, it's shifted in that direction. Um, so for these assumptions, this works only if the air is stationary. If the air is moving relative to you... <clears throat> I guess it's really about the difference between the air's movement relative to the object's movement. So if the object is moving at the same speed as the air speed, um, you wouldn't notice anything. There'd be no Doppler effect shift. <clears throat> Excuse me. Though that would, that would be similar to you moving relative to the to the sound. <clears throat> all right. So all speed measurements are made to a relative medium, a relatively stationary medium. So as far as all objects are concerned, the air isn't moving relative to the ground, relative to the observer. <clears throat> I guess it sort of has to be still relative to the moving object. All right. Don't worry about the air. So here are the sound um, things. I, I've, I've created four slides here to help give you a visual as to what's happening. Um, so you've got this point source. It's probably not really a point source, but something is creating a sound. An earbud. <coughs> or something. It creates sound waves in all directions. <coughs> this is, um, showing a, a two-dimensional version of that. But you should think of these as spherical shells moving outward, right? So this is one, one wave source. So here's the point source. A single wave, a single, um, moving outward getting bigger, right? It goes outward as a sphere from the point at which it was created, but at once it's created, it doesn't have any tie to the actual source. It's tied to the air. So if you had a wind, the whole thing might shift. But we're not going to have any winds going on, right? So here, you've got a stationary point source, and let's just look at each wave. So there's the first wave. Um, now the first wave is here again. It has grown, but by the time it has <clears throat> grown to that size, a second wave has been created. So let's say there's a single note here, um, like somebody's playing an F sharp on a flute, standing still. It's creating that that um, wavelength and frequency that'll be nice and regular. That might not be true depending on what kind of music is playing, right? It might not be regular or constant. Um, so now there's three waves, each of them taking the place of the last. As each shell grows, notice there's a nice constant wavelength between them. This distance is created by the time between when the first part of the note was created, the, the outbeat, and then the inbeat, and the, you know, it's like the, the compression of the air and then the rarefaction and the compression of the speaker as it is generating the sound. 
right? So you can see the sound wave being generated. And if you were standing, say over here, one wave would hit you, then the other, then the other, then the other, at a very regular frequency, at the, at the ordinary frequency, as if you were standing still relative to the object. <clears throat> All right, now let's have the point source move. Here's our point source, and it's here when it generates the first sound wave. And as far as that sound wave is concerned, it will just grow from that point. It does not know that the source is moving. So the second sound wave, now the source has moved. Um, I just want to show you just that one shell for the moment of it will continue to grow outward, right? Re without regard to the fact that the source is moving. So that's a single beat, a single wave crest, right? Moving outward, unaffected by the moving source. All right, so now let's have the source move and show each wave as it's being produced. So there's the source when it produces the first um, wave, and then it moves a little bit to the right and creates a second wave. How much it moves to the right before the second wave comes out depends on how fast the object is going. Yes? So we see this one is centered around this piece, and this one is still centered around the, or the original as it grows. So this continues to happen. Each one grows around its around where the source was when it was generated. And you get this very distinctive shape. Um, worth taking a pause, drawing this shape in your notebook, it's pretty important. So now you see, if you're here, and the the sound is coming towards you, the object is coming towards you, you need a motorcycle, an ambulance or something coming towards you, and then once you're behind it, you see you get these, the wave crests are much further apart. That's a longer wavelength, it represents a lower frequency if the speed of sound is the same coming and going, which it should be. It's only really affected by the temperature of the air. And so here the wave crests are closer together, so um, you get a higher frequency. Shorter wavelength is higher frequency, wider wavelength is lower frequency. So high, you get a high pitch and a low pitch on the way out. All right. <clears throat> so let's take a look at some of the math. Um, we're going to start with case one. Um, you've got a stationary observer. Uh, or sorry, we, now we've got, uh, this is a slightly different situation. We've got an observer moving towards a stationary source. So S is the source of the sound, and it's generating frequency. Now notice if you're moving this way towards it, you get the same sort of effect. Because you're moving, you're going to hit them sooner than you would if, if you were standing still. Because you're after you hit this one, this one is coming towards you, but you cover some of that distance with your bicycle there and hit into the other wave. And then on the way away, you're going to move a little further away before the next one catches up with you. If you're traveling faster than the speed of sound, then you are um, got a bunch of issues. But on the way away, anyway, they're never going to catch up with you and you won't hear it at all. Right? Um, so... You detect wave fronts more often than you should, so you get a frequency that's increased. Moving away, as long as you're not moving faster than the speed of sound, you're still going to hear them, they're going to catch up to you, but you're going to have moved a little bit. The one hits you, um, the other one is coming towards, but you move a little bit, and so it's going to travel a little further distance, um, and so it seems like the wavelength is longer to your ear. So if you're moving away from the source, um, then the speed lowers. And this is really a, just a relativistic. There's no real difference in the physics between the sound moving towards you and you moving towards the sound. You should get the same effect. <clears throat> There's no set thing that says the Earth is the thing against which all measurement is measured. It doesn't work that way. The laws of physics should be the same regardless of wh which of the two objects is moving. There's no way to say. Okay. Um, so here's the math. You're moving towards um, a, a stationary source, right? So the frequency O stands for observed, S stands for source. So the frequency you observe is the frequency of the source, V is the speed of sound, V0 is the speed of the observer, you moving towards the sound, and V again down at the bottom there is again the speed of sound. Okay, divided by again. So, um... If you're moving away from the, 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 the source, you can substitute a minus V0 here rather than a plus V0 and get the correct formula. So write that down. This is not a, a good one to try to remember. Um, tough to do. All right. <clears throat> so there's that picture again with some observers, one being the source is moving away from and one towards. So... 
For observer A, the frequency seems to have increased. For, ob frequency, for observer B, frequency seems to have decreased. That's the most important thing in the world for you to get out of this. If you can't do the math at all, you can still get more than half of these problems right just by understanding this picture and what it means. So, excuse me, a very visual thing. <coughs> so let's do the source moving. You get about the same thing if you just there's a little bit of algebra screwing these up with as far as who's the source and who's the observer, right? So now the observer um, and source, they just flip the, the algebra around. So the source is moving. So this is now the velocity of the source <clears throat> rather than the velocity of the observer. Again, relative. And when it is moving away from the observer, um, you use a V plus when it's moving towards you use V minus. Um, you can tell by putting those numbers in and if your frequency is is um, greater than you know it's moving towards. If it's less than, then you know it's moving away. And you can almost fake this formula in your head if you get that down. I mean, it comes from that visualization. <clears throat> Though not easy to do, worth writing in your notebook. All right. So in general, both the source and the observer might be moving. No one's ever going to give you a problem like this. <clears throat> I can't imagine. Maybe on the free response, but it'd be cruel. <clears throat> but if you want to keep that in, in account, I mean, it's, it's easy enough to puzzle out on your own. Well, not easy, but, but totally doable. You have everything you need to know from that picture to, to define this. V0 is the velocity of the observer, and Vs is the velocity of the source. So... Um, if they are coming together, getting closer together, use positive values. And if they are moving away from each other, because that'll give you the, the higher frequency. And negative if they're moving away, that'll give you the lower frequency. You could try a couple test values and figure out does the frequency get higher or lower if you forget who's positive and who's minus there. <coughs> um, the source and the minus sign on the bottom of the fraction, the observer and the plus sign on the top of the fraction, if that helps any. And I think of mnemonics to memorize it, but I don't really, it's really not worth it. Just write it down. All right, last things to say about the Doppler effect. Um, doesn't matter how far away the object is, and that's kind of cool. We actually use this to determine how fast <clears throat> entire galaxies are moving away from us, and they might be 13 billion light years away from us, but it, the Doppler effect um, <clears throat> is not affected by that distance, other than the fact that the universe is expanding. Um, but we take that into account as well, so that's interesting. Um, all right. So here is an issue if you are traveling um, really fast. So here's the source one. Source two is here, and you'll notice its wave front is further away than this one. So you are traveling faster than the wave itself is moving out. <clears throat> you have moved a distance each one. So here's the like the last one, and here's the second to last one. The source has moved faster than the the sound wave itself has gone. So the you you create a sound wave, it starts moving out, and the source just jumps past it, jumps through it. Um, you're moving faster than the speed of sound. And notice it doesn't matter how much faster, as you do this, the wave crests are still going to bunch up in this conical shell here, right? So whatever mock you are going, um, Mach 1 being the speed of sound, Mach 2 being twice the speed of sound, traveling faster than the speed of sound, you create this shock wave, which is commonly known as a sonic boom. Um, again, this is entirely a picture going on here, right? Um, and if you can puzzle out the meaning of the picture, uh, the physics becomes clear, and you get a good imaginary sense of that, how that shock wave is created. Now remember, these, these circles are actually spheres, right? So those spheres, when you put them together, where they all meet in this place, which is a triangle here, becomes a cone on the next picture, right? Um, <clears throat> sorry, it must be the next slide. I've got a supersonic jet, an actual picture of the, the cone. Um, the angle there does change. So the shape of that cone depends on how fast you are going above the speed of sound. Um, so there's the speed of sound, and there's the speed of the source, and you take the, the sine of that angle is equal to that ratio there. Notice you have to be going faster than the speed of sound for this to work. Right, so you have to have a number less than one there, and you want to you want to do that anyway. Your sign, you want to go from zero to one with that that angle there for the for the cone, right? Or zero to ninety. Rather. <clears throat> you weren't going to get a ninety. You have to be going pretty fast to do that. All right. Um, so that ratio is called the Mach number. The 
speed of your source divided by the speed of sound. So if you're going twice the speed of sound, you get a Mach 2 number. And the shape of that is a shockwave. So there it is. There's my... I didn't take this picture. This is a picture I found of a jet um, doing such a thing. All that energy concentrated in a cone. Um, and where all that air gets squished together, the, the air that you breathe is full of water molecules. There's lots of them. But here, there are enough of them, because all those waves are getting squished together, that um, they actually condense and form a little cloud. <clears throat> Just because you've got wave after wave after wave all pressing into the same point along that cloud, or along that cone, um, and it makes the, the water condense and creates a big boom for your ears. A whole wall of sound just hits you. All of those cone, all of those uh, wave crest energies all hitting you at once. So all the intensity of the sound hitting you at once. So luckily, um, it's still still getting less intensity as it goes further away. So the farther you are away you are from the the jet, the less intensity will be. It doesn't like destroy the entire universe because it's you know one shock wave. The intensity still goes down as one over r squared. <clears throat> All right. Okay. New topic. You've got a standing wave. Now, this might be in a tank of water, or <clears throat> you could do it in, like, a tube. We're going to actually go into... We did strings last time, right? So we could do it on a string, a standing wave on a string. But we're going to use sound waves now <clears throat> rather than matter waves. So this is for our woodwinds. Yeah, we're going to do musical instruments, and this is the biggest part of what we're going to do next. Um, there are a bunch of formulas in this sadly, and some tricks of the trade that I'm going to try to help you with both here and when we do the clicker questions for this. So, um, buckle up, there's still more to do. <laughs> so you've got a sound wave inside a container, usually, you know, some tube for us, right, or a box, and the, the wave travels back and forth. Um, when that happens, the waves, um, the wave going forward and the wave coming back interfere with each other, both constructively and destructively, <clears throat> until they reach sort of this equilibrium where you've got a shape in there, a shape of a sound wave, even though it's not actually being still, it looks as if it's still, even though there's constantly waves moving back and forth. The sum of them create this <clears throat> this this shape that is very wave-like and creates a frequency that you hear and that you used to. So you play on your flute with a very specific length of that <clears throat> that tube before it escapes, and you get a very specific, very distinct, and very repeatable note. So you can draw it, because it looks like it's standing still, so they call it a standing wave. You can actually draw inside the tube, like, a, like if you're playing a pipe organ or something, you can actually draw the shape that's going to fit in there. And there are some cool tricks that go with that. <clears throat> so here's a standing wave on a string. Um, you've got some electronic device where this, this thing, the string is tied to this vibrating blade that goes up and down, and it's set to a very specific frequency, and that frequency, every time it goes up and down, will determine how many nodes you have there and the shape of that standing wave. Notice it sort of goes up and down. There's, a, there's constructive interference both up and down, and there's destructive interference <clears throat> adding up to zero in those places. So we call that the node, is the place where the... Um, uh, the displacements are equal, but in opposite directions, so they add up to zero, right? So they become little points in the string where there's no amplitude. So that's called a node. The distance between the nodes is one half the wavelength. Because remember, the actual wave is going up and then coming back down and then going up again, right? So there's, there's a node in between and then a node at the end. So there's, you go, the distance between nodes is half that of the actual wavelength. That's crazy super important to write down in big letters somewhere. It's the basis for all the math that we're going to do from here on out. Um, and then we call the place where there's either an up or a down, and they they oscillate between up and down, between um, maximum, am um, maximum amplitude and the negative of that maximum amplitude. Um, we call those anti-nodes. Not as important, but, but important. Lingo. <clears throat> There's a little bigger picture of it. Um, the node must occur at the end of the string. Just the physics of the deal is it moving, moving the thing up and down. Um, it's generating the wave up and generating the wave down. And if it doesn't appear, if both of the points are fixed um, and the nodes don't appear, that like you can't have a, an up here because the string can't 
be touching this part of the wall. It can only be touching here. And this thing's not vibrating up and down so crazy much that uh, it's it can be in different places there. So you get nodes at both ends if both ends of the string here are fixed. And what's going to happen with our sound waves is we're going to, if both of the ends of the pipe are closed, um, and you've seen that like on a pipe organ, it opens and closes. If they're both closed, then you must have a node at each end. Anytime you have a wall <clears throat> that the sound is going to bounce back from, um, you must have a node. So the placement of these nodes, it's a very visual thing. You're going to draw pictures and then try to figure out what the wavelengths are and what the frequencies are, knowing the distance of the pipe, the speed of sound, that sort of thing. So we're going to keep it very, um, very basic, but there's a little bit of math in there and a little bit of drawing and imagining. So here I've got closed on both ends. I've got a standing wave. My nodes are forced to be on each end. <clears throat> now this isn't the only shape I can get. I can have as many nodes in between as I want, depending on how fast it is vibrating up and down. I might get many more nodes than this. Like how many times, how many waves are are, are existing at one point. Um, but this is the one of the. This is the simplest case. Well, I guess it isn't the simplest case. It's uh, the second simplest case. We get a node here and a node here. <clears throat> you could just have one up and come back down, right? And that would still have a node at each point. Um, so the standing waves, you've got some parts of the thing traveling down, some parts of the thing traveling up. Um, remember a couple of videos ago I showed you, um, there was a link to that website. Feel free to go back there and check that out. You can see this pretty well when you're doing that. <clears throat> so you're going through, there's a certain amount of, there's a period here, right? So here's your start. When you come back to this exact shape, you would have a full period. Notice down here at E, they've only gone through half a period. Everybody who is up is, is now down. Everybody who is down is now up. When it goes back to that, um, when it reverses that again, you'll have gone through an entire period of the cycle of the thing. <clears throat> so be able to visualize the parts of that string is a little bit important. So everybody in within each between each node is going in the same direction, either up or down. And everybody in the next node is usually doing the opposite, right? So right here he's going up while these guys are going down, and he's up again. So <clears throat> here's some standing waves on a string tied between two ends. This here would be um, your fundamental frequency is the lowest frequency. They're going to use that term fundamental frequency um, and however you need to memorize that it's the, the lowest frequency possible. As you look here, you draw it. Since it has to be a node on each end, this is the smallest you can make it. Um, the least number of nodes that you can have. And you'll notice the length of the string is half a wavelength. It goes up, comes down, but doesn't go down underneath. Right? So here we've got up, down, you've got a full wavelength, and here you've got up, down, back to you st where you started, and then half again. So that's <coughs> one and a half wavelengths is your third frequency. So if you want to know what frequencies are possible in a string, and you're going to, you're going to actually use this formula, unlike some of the Doppel, um, uh, Doppler effect stuff. Um, so write this down. The frequency, N here, talks about which frequency, which number, which number of possible. So it's n times the first frequency, one being the fundamental frequency, or n times uh, all this other stuff here. Don't worry about that. Write it down. L is the length of the string. F is the tension in the string, the force on the string, and um, mu is the density of the string again, right? So this here, you would put a 1 in here, a 2 in here, and a 3 in here. n equals 1 because it's the fundamental frequency. Two is the next up. It doesn't mean it has two nodes. It means it's the next frequency available. And three is the third frequency that is available for that shape. The futzing around with these ends and which one is which and which one is fundamental is the hardest part of this chapter, this unit. And we got to get some practice with it and um, do your best. Um, the wavelength is just, just by doing um, a little bit of math and thing is nl over 2. So if n is 1, and notice here it's l over 2. Notice this is for standing waves on a string. It is fixed at both ends. That's really all we're going to get with a string. If you, you've never played bass guitar where one of, or, uh, or played the violin where one of the ends, like the string is broken, like it's not connected on one of the ends. It doesn't really work well that way. So we can always connect these at both ends. That's not going to be true with sound. We're going to, with sound, we're going to have closed at both ends, 
open it. Well, actually, I don't think we do closed at both ends. How do you how do you get any sound out of it? Um, I think we do open at one end and open at both ends. You can get sound in. I don't think we do open closed at both ends. Not sure. All right. <clears throat> so F1, F2, and F3, and so on. F and to however many you can fit in there, form something called the harmonic series. You, these are these harmonics um, all fit on the same string at the same length and whatnot, and so they produce um, frequencies that are related to each other. So F1 is the first harmonic, F2 is the second harmonic, and so on. If it isn't part of the harmonic series and something like you, it adds in, um, it, because it doesn't bounce back the same at both ends, it's going to cancel itself out. These are the only ones on that length of string, these are the only possibilities that don't cancel themselves out, that in fact constructively interfere instead of destructively interfere, and so that's what's possible on that string. That's why in order to, when you play a note of a certain length on a string, you get, you get one, one sound out of it. Um... Yeah, this, it sort of self-selects this by destroying all the ones that don't exist and, and uh, building up the ones that can. Um, there's actually a lot of analogy here to quantum mechanics, and, and the nature of our reality is very wave-like, not just particle-like. <clears throat> but we are many, many months away from doing that. All right. Um, so normally you pluck a string and it will sort of damp itself out after a while. But if you have a driving force in there, you have something repeatedly adding energy to the system, um, you can get a certain frequency uh, out of the system. Um, if the frequency of the driving force, something is tapping on it, happens to equal the frequency of one of these harmonics, if you tap on a string in the proper place or with the proper frequency, the, then the energy goes up the string and comes back down and gets tapped just as it's coming back, right? Like pushing your, your little brother on the swing. If you push him at the middle, it ruins it. But if you push him in just the right place where he comes back, you keep adding energy to that. Um, and that's called resonance. <clears throat> when, when something is driving a system at its frequency of one of the harmonics, you get something called resonance. <clears throat> so we've got these three cans um, on a bar. And remind me in class if you want. There are some really cool YouTube videos. I just don't want to extend this any longer than I've, I've got you here. But remind me, they're super cool. Um, so if I start swinging A back and forth, um, B feels the vibration in the pole and will get a little bit of motion. But because it's it wants to do a frequency that's dependent on L. Remember, the, the frequency of a pendulum is about the length of the string only. And so it's trying to do this other thing. And so it's getting it gets kind of like knocked and it becomes awkward. Um, but C here is the exact same length. Um, and for pendulums, if they have the same length, they have the same natural frequency, right? Square root of G over L. And their angular frequency anyway, so 2 pi times that. And they'll actually both start moving together. Whereas B and D will just sort of... Uh, Jiggle around a little bit. <clears throat> so set pendulum A into motion. The other vibrates, um, but dissonantly. Whereas C will <clears throat> be will feel a resonance. It is being um, driven at its ang at its um, natural frequency and begins to move in sync with A. <coughs> All right, well, a little bit more to do. Um, <clears throat> we have to do the woodwinds now. So, um, if you have one end of an air column closed, you must have a node at the closed end. But the open end um, has to be an anti-node. So that simplifies it. There's not an infinite number of things that you can have. You have a node on one end, and if it's, o if it's closed, you have to have a node. If it's open, you have to have an anti-node for this to work. <clears throat> and that simplifies the, the, the amount of things that you can draw, the amount of cases. However, it's still more cases than is particularly entertaining or pleasant. And we'll try some. Let's take a look. So here we go. Open at both ends. <clears throat> you get a natural frequency such that you have um, an anti-node at both ends. Whatever you can draw that will allow you to have an anti-node at both ends. And I think the, the minimum you can do with that, you can't really... Cause it, 
like you can't have an anti-node and an anti-node together. There's got to be a node in there. So the most you can do is one node at the center. Sorry, the least you can do. A node at the center and two anti-nodes at the outside. That'll be your fundamental frequency. Remember, n equals 1 is the smallest you can have. It's, in this case, it happens to be one node, but it doesn't necessarily have to be for the other situations, for the other pictures. So this is the fundamental frequency you can have. A new formula, write down that it's for open at both ends. Right? n is the frequency of the harmonic, so n equals 1 is the fundamental guy. Right? n equals 2, the only difference is you multiply it by 2. So once you find the fundamental frequency, finding the other guys is just about multiplying them together. Um, v is the speed of sound. That's new. We didn't have to worry about that on the string, but we had something representing the speed of, of sound through the material. Right? Um, and L is the length of the tube, of the open-ended tube. <clears throat> so here's a picture of that. Um, notice it's not perfectly open, but it's open enough at the end, right, in order to blow on this wood. That's why I get confused. I think of this sometimes as closed, but it's not. It's open. Notice it's an anti-node and an anti-node, and that's the smallest you can have. That's your first harmonic for open at both ends. Boy, draw all these in. I would definitely draw these in your notebook, boy. That's hard enough worth doing. This will be the second harmonic, right, the second fundamental frequency. We'll have two nodes, and here, one, two, three. Um, in this case, it's a coincidence, I think, how many nodes they have versus what, what fundamental frequency they are. I know they use N there. N stands for natural numbers. One, two, three, four, five. It doesn't stand for nodes. Now, that's a huge mistake people make. All right. So let's do closed at one end. Um, so the closed end has to be a node, and the open end must be an anti-node. And then you can draw your pictures again, and from those pictures you can futz out this... Um, twice I've used that weird word. You can, you can figure out for yourself um, this formula, though that takes a little mathematical ingenuity. Um, notice here the ends do not go... Um, natural numbers, I guess. They're one, not 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. They're 1, 3, 5. So they have to be odd. They just didn't want to change the n symbol, I guess, there. So um, those are your only possibilities. One, The odd numbers, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. For your open at one end, closed at the other end. For some, somehow, because you're closing one end, you're cutting off half of the possibilities. So remember that. So that's why you only get half as many integers, right? Half as many ends um, as to what's available. Um, so no even multiples because of that. So here we go. <clears throat> so here we close this end. This end is still our open end. So it's an anti-node here and a node here. Notice the smallest you can have is actually pretty small. Um, I guess, well, I guess it has one node, two nodes, three nodes. But remember, you don't want to put n equals one, two, three. So n doesn't stand for nodes. That's why you get important. This is one, three, five, right? Um, and the actual wavelength itself that fits in there um, takes a little bit of, of work to figure out, but um, the wavelength there is four times the length of the pipe because it, it's only gone halfway up, then it would come down, and then it would do the reverse, right? So one, two, three, four. Back down again. Mm -hmm. Hey, this is the last slide. Good news. Um, beats are a little bit strange. Um, Basically, you've got two um, waves that are um, different from each other in some way, um, and they're they're just they're just off frequency from each other. So if you look here, the black and the blue are two um, sounds that have a different frequency from each other, and because they have a different frequency from each other, they just don't match up often. Sometimes they constructively interfere, sometimes they destructively interfere, but remember, the air doesn't know, all the air knows is that it's being compressed or rarefied, it doesn't know why or, or what's going on around it, right? So when it is compressed by two different things, you get a, you get a, they add up, that's why it's a superposition principle. This is, they're being pushed by two different things, so it gets, you know, twice that push. Um, and when the rarification is is in sync, then you get you get no sound there, right? And when it isn't, you get a little bit. So you create if you actually literally add this plus this, you get the you get the red thing down. Uh, the red shape at the bottom is the sum of the the black and the blue above. And you'll notice you get this sounds within sounds, but you get a rising frequency. Um, so you get you get an um, you get notes, right? all over the place from the two. Um, and you get sort of sounds within sounds. 
Um, all you need to know about this is the shape. Look at this and, and understand that that superposition thing is happening. And then this formula here, the, the beats are F2 minus F1. And which one is F2 and which one is F1 um, doesn't really matter. Just take the absolute value of it, right? If you take the bigger one or the smaller one, it doesn't matter. You're getting the difference between them when you add them up will tell you how often you get a, a frequency, right? The frequency of this new sort of funky super wave. The end. Nice work.